Thanks. Thanks, Center for Fiction and um, Brooklyn Book Festival and Orion Magazine uh, for co-sponsoring this event and these lovely panelists who I will introduce very briefly because we have a lot to talk about. Um, Garnett Cadigan is an essayist. He's the Tunney Lee Distinguished Lecturer in Urbanism at MIT, a senior critic at the Department of Sculpture at Yale School of Art and a fellow at the Institute for the Advanced Studies and Culture at University of Virginia. John Freeman is the founder of the literary annual Freeman's and editor of multiple anthologies, including the Penguin Book of Modern American Short Story. Other books include How to Read a Novelist, Dictionary of the Undoing, which I keep close at hand. I've worn a copy out. And he's published two volumes of poetry, Maps and the Park. Also, uh, the trilogy of anthologies about inequality, which we're going to talk about tonight. Finally, he's current artist, currently an artist in residence at NYU and executive editor at Knopf. Samantha Prabaker is the editor of Orion Magazine and he helped edit the late stages of my book. And on the side, he's a beautiful writer and runs the operations of Madras Press, a charitable publisher whose catalog includes works by Lydia Davis, Ben Marcus and David Foster Wallace, for example. Emily Rabiteau is a friend, a critic, street photographer, and author of The Professor's Daughter and Searching for Zion, winner of an American Book Award. Her themes are race, social, and environmental justice, parenting, and public art. And she is a creative writing professor at the City College of New York. Sarah Smarsh is a journalist who has reported for the New York Times, The Guardian, and many other publications. Her first book, Heartland, a memoir of working hard and being broke in the richest country on earth, was a finalist for the National Book Award. Her second book, She Come By at Natural, um, Dolly Parton and the Woman Who Lived Her Songs is both a tribute and a critical look at Parton's work. Phew, I have all these books here. I should have held them up while I was talking about them, but I will. Anyway, in brief too, Orion, where I work, is a nonprofit uh, environmental magazine based out of Western Mass with the tagline of people in nature. It's been around for about 40 years. We're a small but mighty team that delivers environmental storytelling to your doorstep four times a year, right? Um, and more often online. And somebody's gonna put a link in the chat to give you a 20% off Orion subscription. So get that. Um, <clears throat> and we're also going to, after, uh, after we're done and after Center for Fiction posts this up on their website, we're gonna provide a reading list of more environmental storytelling for you to look at. That's that. Okay, sorry. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Just a quick introduction to this talk. Um, I wanted to ask Emily, John, Garnett, Sarah, Sumant, because they all have such different perspectives on how to teach, tell, or discover environmental stories. One that, ones that bring more attention to climate crisis and environmental disasters and the staggering depths of both. <clears throat> But those two terms, disaster and crisis, kind of auguring part of the storytelling problem that we face, because environmental stories can sometimes be wrapped in this alarmist language, which can turn readers off. Um, some environmental stories are non-narrative, like how do you tell a compelling story about drought? Um, what about nature writing, too, is something Sumanth and I often talk about, where you reminisce about past landscapes that may never have even existed. Um, and some stories drown in academic journals or deliver information rather than stories themselves. Anyway, <clears throat> it's a lot to talk about there. Um, of course, these protest theory, outrage, writing about trees are all valuable modes, but I've been wondering since we did this last year, um, how can stories move the needle even just a little on, on on action or perhaps even legislation or even just bring people closer to a world in a world that's such a mess. Sumant, I would love to start with you. <laughs> Emily and I were discussing the other day, there's one word you often summon when you talk about environmental storytelling and that word is mystery. I wonder if you could talk about what that word means to you and in the context of this conversation. Yeah, uh, thanks. It's an important word to me. Um, my mom forced Masterpiece Mystery on me as a child. And uh, that method of storytelling is like deep in my bones. Um, and everything that I read now, I unknowingly sort of 
um, judge based on a certain kind of narrative set of expectations um, around mystery. Um, <clears throat> We think a lot at, in the Orion editorial office about the concept of dominion and dominion sort of, sort of is, the, is, is the dark cloud hanging over um, a lot of the topics that we express anxiety about, um, the dominion of, of humankind over the more than human world. And, uh, um, and all of the modes of storytelling that you sort of touched on, Carrie, I, I feel like are different ways that different cohorts kind of try to counterbalance or dismantle uh, you know, the, the infrastructure of dominion. You, know, you, you see it and you're outraged about it and you yell about it, or you feel like, well, dominion is, um, dominion is, is born of a lack of compassion for our natural surroundings, therefore, you know, Mary Oliver is the deepest act of protest you can imagine because, you know, she's, she's here to sort of espouse compassion. Um, and and they, all, they all come from these different, you know, I, I mean, probably different people whose moms forced them to watch different BBC shows when they were kids. And, and it's, it just kind of calibrated their understanding of story. Um, for us, uh, I, I think mystery is really important because um, it allows for volatility in your surroundings. It requires uh, it requires that you not fully understand everything that's around you. And when I imagine what lies at the heart of dominion, it's the idea that. Um, I'm sorry, by the way, my little pony movie is like blasting on the television downstairs right now. So I, I might occasionally just mute myself if things get really embarrassing. Um, I, I, anyway, uh, the, um, uh, what was I saying? Um, D I, Dominion, I think is predicated very much on uh, a sense of intellectual ownership. The idea that um, a human walks into a, a, a pretty field and fully understands you know, everything about every aspect that's around them, or at least believes in the possibility of understanding. Um, and in order for our relationship for our surroundings to become one that's deferential, one that allows room for um, a sense of reverence, um, I think it's really important that there be a um, unnecessary lack of understanding. Um, so that we are capable of being surprised by what's around us. Um, and so like oftentimes when I'm visiting, you know, a creative writing class or something, um, a very easy line that, that seems to communicate that sentiment is uh, in Orion, the, the Orion office judges a pitch based on the number of question marks. Um, if, you, if you see a pitch that says, you know, I, I went to this place and I was reminded of this stuff that I researched when I was a PhD student. And, uh, you know, it, I just, I wanted to share my, my, my expertise and my experience with the world. Um, there's a sort of necessary end to that argument. Whereas if a pitch is wondering and says, you know, I was at the beach and I saw a crab smoking a cigarette and sipping a Coke. And it, it really caught my attention and I can't stop thinking about it. And I don't know why, I just, I just dream about this crab and I wanna understand what it is that's so important to me about this crab. The lack of understanding is kind of contagious there. Um, and it, it, it becomes really energizing um, and, and, and inviting. Um, so I, I don't know, I, I, sh I don't wanna go on too long. So I wanna say- No, I, I, I just wanna ask something else because you, we talked about this too. And I didn't hear, I only heard you say the word volatility, but you, you said something we need to be, teach people to be more scared too. Um, and I wonder if you could just, just tell people what you told me about that. I thought that was a really interesting way to talk about environmental storytelling. Yeah, I mean, I think mystery and fear go hand in hand, right? The idea, there's, there's, there's wonder, which is mystery, which is, which is a, um, a form of mystery, a form of alluring mystery, or maybe an, a response to mystery. Um, 
one that that sees the unknown and and feels a uh, uh, compulsion towards it and and then there's 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 the opposite experience which is when you see the unknown and and you feel um you feel you feel nervous enough to kind of keep to your own space and when we think about like what is the sentiment that's going to ultimately um I, I i don't know what's what's the sentiment that will ultimately provoke change or, or move the needle or whatever how, you know however you want to describe it um you know we've seen outrage get stacked up and it has some efficacy uh we've seen compassion get stacked up and that has some efficacy so none of this is like a competition but i just i think that uh i think fear as a sentiment really uh, deserves a little bit more credit than it gets. Um, I think the idea that humans can learn to be afraid of overstepping their boundaries, can yeah. relearn to be afraid of being outside, can relearn to be, um, to can, can relearn the reality that we're often the least powerful creature in a given space. Um, is is one that's very actually exciting to me to think about because. It resonates with my own personal experience and with a lot of people I know. You know, I, I, I it's weird to say this as the editor of a of a magazine about nature, but my relationship with nature is characterized more by fear than by like, you know, a bucolic sense of of wonder and and awe or whatever. It's it's a it's a frightening world, and I think the more that we can all believe that, the more we'll kind of not overstep our own um, footprint and, and kind of um, allow things to, to operate as they perhaps ought to. I, I, I can't agree more. I'm terrified of the woods and forests and things that crawl and animals, all that stuff. Um, I understand. <laughs> Emily, speaking of terror uh, and mystery, your essay Sparkbird, which was in Orion. Thank you, Samantha, by the way. Um, if anybody too, well, while I ask questions, if you have a response to what anybody else said, I, I, I want to hear that too. We'll be able to do that um, as I go around. Um, <clears throat> you, the Sparkbird in the spring 21 issue, it sort of traces your discovery of the Audubon Mural Project, which is this public art initiative that commissions artists to paint murals of 389 bird species under threat from climate crisis. Um, the project started in ha Harlem, where you live, and was a bit inspired, right, by John J. Audubon, who also lived in Harlem, and his book, Birds of America. And that essay, I, I read it again today, it's about so many things. But one thing it's about noticing, about paying careful attention to the obvious and the not so obvious signs of environmental destruction. And I wonder if you could talk about um, what Audubon's birds besides them being spark birds, but and what they sparked in you and how they summoned environmental justice beyond the boundaries of just endangered birds. Oh, you're muted. Yeah. Thanks for that question. Uh, yeah, spark bird is a term I learned actually from the writer Lacey Johnson. And the spark bird is the bird that sparks somebody who then becomes a birder into, into the passion of bird watching. So usually if you talk to somebody who's, who's an impassioned bird watcher, there was an, or like an origin bird, a spark bird that they witnessed somewhere that they fell in love with and that draws them into the path of, of becoming a bird watcher. So I like that term because I think, um, when you think about a spark, yeah, it's it's in that same category of some of the words that Samantha was just using and in, in, in trying to get at what Orion Magazine is after. The, a word he's used a lot in conversation with me is wonder, like quality that he's after and the kind of writing, the kind of environmental storytelling he wishes to publish. Um, and I think awe, he, he, he used it almost as an aside just now, Sumanth, but I think it, it also is a better word at capturing fear as well as wonder. Um, you know, it's at the root of the word awful. When something is awful, um, 
we're full of awe in, in, in witnessing it. And so, yeah, for me as somebody who lives and works in this part of upper Manhattan where the, this bird mural project is unspooling itself um, with the aspiration to catalog all of these birds that are endangered by, by the climate crisis and expected by 2080 to be extinct, I felt a sense of like awe it, because the birds themselves are very beautiful. So in that that way that you that you experience beautiful art, especially in an unexpected place like on the street, is something I wanted to get at. So when Samantha is talking about like the question mark being the invitation into the story, for me it was like, well, what's going on? Why are all these birds appearing? <laughs> What's the connection between this bird on this corner and that bird on that corner? Because clearly there's a there's something afoot drew me into wanting to, as a photographer, capture the birds. Also, because I know public art is ephemeral. Murals are, are not going to be there forever. So I wanted to catalog them and capture them. But further than that, I wanted to understand the connections between um, Audubon himself, who had lived in the neighborhood, the Audubon Mural Project, which is a partnership between local business people who agree to have these birds painted on their on their storefronts, the artists who who paint the birds, um, and the people who live in the neighborhood who witness the birds, and also the ties between what makes those birds endangered and the environmental um, factors and injustices that are endangering the people who inhabit the neighborhood, including myself and my children. So, I mean, the last thing I want to say about environmental storytelling and my own foray into it is just that I, I used to be a travel writer before I had children. I wrote a book called Searching for Zion, which is like a journey across um, several nations, uh, trying to understand the pull of Zionism as a force in the African diaspora. And it brought me to a lot of fascinating realms. And then I, I had children and became, for better or worse, kind of firmly rooted in New York City, uh, where I work and parent. and. Um, writing for me kind of took a turn towards like the local, the hyper local. I, I didn't understand originally until, until Garnet actually brought a wonderful pivotal, I think important essay by Camille Dungy to my attention, which is called, is not all writing environmental writing that appeared in the Georgia Review, uh, which made me think, okay, whereas I had previously understood environmental writing to somehow be synonymous with nature writing, I actually, in turning my lens as a writer um, to my extremely local environment, like the question marks arising around me, uh, when I when I look at the surround, right, um, are are a form of environmental writing too. Even though I live in a built environment, um, if I can apply the same qualities that were easy to apply when I traveled, right, awe, wonder even love those that way that we are we are fully awake in our senses when we are unsettled because we are um, in a foreign realm I had to learn to apply to my local habitat and when I did I realized what I was doing was environmental writing I mean you also draw the lines in that essay too between the birds themselves that are endangered and the neighborhoods that are being gentrified and and sort of the endangerment of that too I mean you do which is an environmental justice injustice um, problem, um, which I think also echoes your piece, Climate Signs, too, uh, in the New York Review of Books, that essay upon that you stumble upon these big giant um, signs, literal big flashing signs that say things like climate denial kills and no icebergs ahead and all kinds of caution. Um, and I feel like those two things that, you know, the birds and the signs, the, they are these signs, they're sort of lighting the way uh, uh, of you. And you're, and you're also a photographer in both of these things. You're kind of reframing them too in another kind of art and another storytelling device. And I wonder if, um, if do you think that these, you know, are these signs, are these the signs that are gonna move, that are gonna spark leaders maybe, or, or, or students, maybe your students, you're also a teacher too. You know, I, I know we talked briefly about how your students are somewhat frustrated, I guess, maybe that's not the word, but frustrated by like their lack of agency and able to do something about environmental problems. 
Yeah, I'm teaching a climate writing class right now at City College, which is, has its campus in Harlem where these birds are unfolding <laughs> in the environment. And um, I see a couple of them in the audience, hello. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, you know, they've asked, they've been asking me, I think, really important questions about this kind of writing. Like, what is the, pur what is the purpose? I mean, they're trying to get at, you know, if this isn't moving the needle, to use your term, um, on policy or action, then is, it, is, is the writing a failure? Like, what is the aim? And I, I think that's an interesting question <laughs> in itself when I don't have an easy answer for. But I, I at least for myself, I seem to find that um, art, public art unfolding in my local um, habitat, in the one case, the, the bird murals, and in the other, as you just mentioned, is, um, it was another public art project about the climate crisis that was, um, uh, that was in the form of these signs also around New York City, um, flashing kind of alarming messages about what we can expect. And in both cases, I felt like art is a soft pathway into a dark, subject that I feel like I can wrestle with the art and I can interview the artists and I can I can witness um, as like a museum goer of the street how this is acting on me and and try to really grapple with what it's trying to say um, in this at this point in time that that's what I can do and um, I don't know that my that my I, I, I can't say that like that's going to change anything in, in, a, in a really radical fashion, but I do know that it belongs to a category of writing that I hope, uh, you know, if my words can be the drop in a bucket of something larger that is like a stream, and I like to think of it that way, um, then that, that's, I think that, you know, it helps to think of oneself as being part of a larger project. Maybe that maybe part of the larger project too is is why why is it climate crisis in the core of our core curriculum even I mean it seems like if every story is environmental story that should be part of the core of learning I don't know I'm just throwing that out there for other teachers so John um, and you John has a lot of books I want to talk about tonight um, Dictionary of the Undoing uh, Tale of Two Planets. Uh, his anthology on climate crisis and inequality and his poetry book the park so in these three books like emily you this idea of public space and monuments is also echoed echoed in there um like in dictionary of the undoing you you write m the letter m john takes the whole alphabet and has like kind of recreates the language or reevaluates language and and for the letter m you write about monuments um, you say, you wondered, what if we had more monuments to writers, painters, poets, glass workers, which made me think of Emily's, like the birds and the climate signs, you know? Um, and then the introduction of Tale of Two Planets. You also talk about um, public space and, and um, monuments in St. Sulpice and Fer Paris. A man washes himself in a fountain because it's 109 degrees. Then you go into the history of that fountain and the underground architecture of Paris. And you lead us from that fountain into the very soil under the city was like honeycombed out and creating sinkholes in the ground. And then you take go from there to other stories about how other extractions have led to more modern problems. And in the park too, like, I don't know if you're, you're doing this, this is something you're following, but you again write about public space um, and monuments because first of all, because a park is obviously a public space, a shared green space of relax, relaxation, leisure, um, spying on people, making out, whatever. Um, and you also sum, summon monuments in that, in that collection. And I'm looking for your book because I want you to read a poem from it, if you don't mind. Do you have that with you? Do, do you I mean, do you have that, that screenshot I sent you? No, but I have it on my phone now. Yeah, so it's called the Death Givers. Yeah, and 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 I I looked it up, and Luxembourg Gardens, which this book is is based, is um has 106 monuments. Um, so monuments are kind of hard to avoid, and it's something I really look at when I go into parks too. So I wonder, will you just read that? It's so small, but really important. Sure. Um, it's nice to be here with. Uh everyone and to be part of this Orion discussion and thanks everyone for for dialing in. 
Um, just before I read this, I listening to Samantha and, and Emily speak, I've, I feel like one of the things that we got wrong about um, our place in the environment is, is the interpretation of the competition of species and survival of fittists. Because obviously there's, there's much more cooperation in nature than um, I think Darwin at first realized. And, I, and Darwin's ideas became the, Rebecca Solnit writes about this in Paradise Built in Hell, became a kind of map for how we lived as humans. And then we mapped that map back on the environment and that environment then mapped itself back on us. And I, I think we create feedback loops wherever we go. Um, and so one of the challenges of a, environmental storytelling is to break those loops, you know, to break or call attention to broken narratives, whether it's, you know, nature writing can't exist in a built environment, whether it's, you know, Harlem or Sacramento. Um, and the other is, is the idea of dominion. Um, and, I, and I think part of the problem, the reason that we can't break them as readily is one is, is the, how hard it is to pay attention and I think that's the, one of the number one goals of environmental storytelling. Um, no, it wasn't Darwin who created social Dar Darwinism. It was his, um, some of his, his ancestors, I agree. De and Deborah Baker is exactly the person to ask that. This is a very illustrious group of attendees. Um, uh, but it, part of the reason we can't break those cycles is, is, a, is a, an impoverishment of, of attention. And I think environmental storytelling has to make us more able, or it has to ready, it has to make us more ready to pay attention. And that doesn't mean it has to be awe or wonder. Um, there can, there's other ways of paying attention, other tones of attention. And I think the other thing that um, environmental storytelling has to some degree address is, is our spiritual impoverishment. Um, and that, that doesn't mean you have to believe in a, in a Christian or monotheistic or any kind of God. But, you know, I think, Tracy K. Smith is an environmental storyteller. If you read her poems um, and about the way they situate us within a universe. Um, and hopefully I think environmental storytelling resituates us as participants and observers in the world around us, you know, and to some degree, for me, that sometimes the most powerful works are those that resituate humans to out of the center um, of the of the attention or as the, uh, the, the primary actor, even, even though I know we've obviously had massive effects on, on the biosphere. Um, if we only focus on human interaction, I think we miss a lot of the complexity of what's going on. So that's a very long statement prelude okay. to a poem that has nothing no, to do with ask, that. I wanna ask you something about that before you, maybe we skip the poem, I don't know. No, I wanna ask you about the poem, but, but if we recenter away from humans, so how how to if we do that, how do we produce environmental stories that that can benefit or consider more accurately the groups concerned if those groups are people? Does that make sense? I don't think as a writer you can write from a group necessarily. You write as a one that's part of a group, possibly that's considering amongst groups. But some of the best environmental storytelling I've read has found ways to um, acknowledge what Samantha was speaking about, which is that sense of, of illegibility and mystery that we feel when confronted with the natural world because we've destroyed, lost, or misremembered all the languages that it speaks and that we, don't, we can't understand all of it. Um, and you read something like Arctic Dreams and you know, Barry Lopez has found a way to write as a human crossing a piece of Arctic tundra and then projects the, his point of view out of his own body into the body of a bear looking back at a human walking across the landscape at him and wonders, creative nonfictionally, what the bear makes of him approaching. And that sounds quite trippy, but it's, it's a necessary um, um, tilting of point of view, I think, if we're ever gonna begin to, un to understand um, how distorting our presence is in, in many environments and, and how distorting it is to only see through uh, the eyes of Western science. Yes, the rings of Saturn is a really good example. Um, so th 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 does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah ish. Um, yeah, it does. <laughs> um, 
Yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, back to the poem, I think the uh, poetry, well, poetry for one and parks two are, are both ways to pay attention as you were talking about, you know, um, and I think that's why I, I I looked at this poem because you're 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 in this park, you're in the Luxembourg Gardens, you're lo looking around. You're, you know, normally what we think of looking around in parks are all these kind of nice things, but you see this statue perhaps and write about that, and that's why I wanted you to read that. It's just a little bit of a different kind of attention, you know. Well, one and of the things I was trying to do in that book is to try to write about the built environment as if it was is with the same um, uh, assumptions that we often write about the animal world. Uh, and, and so I'm with, and with the same kind of senses of projection and mystery that we sometimes apply in nature writing. So the built environment of the, of the park is the strangest uh, part of the park. And it's the parts, those parts of the, of the book are the, are the, are the most surreal. Whereas right. um, when I'm trying to write about uh, the other 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 forms of wildlife which share the park with anyone who's in the park, um, I'm trying not to project onto them the things that um, that we often do as as observers of nature. And I don't know if it's because I've worked for a long time as an editor, but to me, most spaces are collaborative or shared. You know, and I, and I, th I think one of the challenges of environmental storytelling is how to capture that from a single point of view. So the the point of view within the poems um, switches and alters throughout the the book. It's not just simply me. And sometimes the me or the speaker is more aware of themselves as a person, and sometimes they recede um, mm -hmm. and are almost perceived by animal life. But in, in terms of environmental storytelling, what it can do is I, I think it has to recapture that sense of shared space. Um, the, the idea of a kind of, you know, almost, um, you know, it, lit, it, lit helmet of a cone of attention, um, being able to, to completely eliminate what it feels like to be in any kind of environment um, is, is somehow not enough because there, there's almost always someone or something else there with us well the, i mean this this book does i mean it it kind of shows how that public space can act as an equalizer but also kind of highlights the inequalities too right i mean this this entire book of poems does that well i think um anytime you you recreate a, a physical space an imaginary space you uh you somehow be become far more aware of the imaginary's impact on real space, because the the, the 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 way that we build our environments is is based on phantoms and fantasies often, and the way we draw and and, and recreate nature is often built, um, based on those fantasies. And I, I think to some degree that the inequalities that we have come to, to assume are natural or very unnatural. Um, and in order to persist without seeing them, we have to create fantasies that allow us to, to not see them. And one of those fantasies is, is that not paying attention or not calling attention to it is somehow more dignified for those um, in, in spaces where those in spaces that are shared that don't have enough. And so I, I, I think environmental storytelling has to deal with, with inequality. Yeah, I mean, well, this, this statue that you write about, you know, that's kind of elevates one history and subdues others, doesn't it? Without regard to the importance of those suppressed. I mean, it's like a war statue or something that you're writing about. I mean, whether you met, go ahead. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, uh, Garnett and, and Sarah have written really well about monuments and the way that they're projecting um, fantasias about certain places into public spaces, they're kind of like, like beacons. Um, and I, I, I just became concerned that so many of the statues we see are based on war. They're always generals on horseback. 
And part of this poem was trying to deal with that. And then, in fact, the poem began in a park in Romania. It wasn't in Paris. And um, I was with a Romanian friend and they were telling me who the person was and why they were there and, and why he had a sword drawn. And part of it was because, you know, he had supposedly killed lots of people in battle. And it, it just seemed like a very strange thing to become used to. Um, uh, that, and, and yet they're everywhere uh, um, in public spaces. And so I, I think one of the things that environmental storytelling has to do to some degree is it's not just see what's there, but imagine what, what could be there. Um, that's all. Statues of poets, perhaps, <laughs> or something. Um, I just have one more question, and then I want to talk to Sarah um, to you. You wrote in this piece about your friendship with Barry Lopez for Orion that I just can't stop thinking about. And every time I say it, everybody just gets it. I don't, maybe you wrote, he wasn't speaking to you from a perch, but a porch somewhere deep inside his mind. Like he was his own message in a bottle. And I just wonder if you could address that. I think it, it feels like something, not just that Barry did, but we should all kind of strive to do. Do you? Can you talk about that just for a second? That that you wrote that, it's kind of emblazoned yeah, Barry, in my brain. Barry was a really dear friend, and I think a lot of people probably listening to this call had some interaction with him or his work. And you've been asking yourself, or asking the panelists so far, how to have an impact. Um, and I think. Um, Emily mentioned the word love, which is a very important word. Love is, is not a sort of commodity that can be shipped in volume. It has to be delivered and titrated, you know, often person to person. And that's what's so powerful about work. You know, when you read it on a page, it's talking only to you. It's not meant for nine people to crowd over the page. It's, it's really only written to you. Um, and sometimes it's written to the person um, who's writing it, you know, and I think Barry had a way of trying to draw out the best in himself, the most enlarged presence. Um, and it made him both very um, vulnerable because he admitted his fallibility and his, you know, his weaknesses and desires and sometimes vanities. Um, but it also made him um, very inspiring, you know, because it felt like his goal was to try to live up to his own expectations and to maybe maybe move himself to, to, to live with a gentler um, impact on the world and with a more enlarged viewpoint of what it meant to be human. Um, and to me, that's an immense challenge. Um, and I, so I think the challenge environmental storytelling has to have maybe begin with is, is how to draw out that sense of um, ethical placement of ourselves, just as individuals doing the writing in the world. Um, and and that, is, that, that can easily be made fun of. It's not like you're supposed to move yourself to weeping as an environmental storyteller, but moving yourself to, to, to be um, an instrument for um, something bigger than yourself. That's, that's really, I think, what he was asking of himself and why he was so inspiring. Thank you. And I also have a question in the Q&A. They're like, please read that poem now. <laughs> people, people want to hear you read that poem. <laughs> I'm sorry to switch back to that, but. Um, no, no, I'll, I'll read it after. You, okay, you want to read it? Talk to Sarah and Garnett. They're, they're... Yeah, they're, I know they're waiting in the wings. Sarah, Sarah's so good to talk to you and meet you finally these past week. Um, you know, um, everyone in this panel is writes, teaches, and publishes stories, I think, around the axis of inequality, which is why I asked you to join us, um, because I feel like you're ground zero for that in so many ways in your work and who you are, you know, writing from and about the landscape of gender, environmental, and socioeconomic inequality. Um, and I see your two books, Heartland and She Come By a Natural 
both of them here. There, I can finally raise a book. I see them in conversation with each other, really about class divides, the rural landscapes of America and the myth of the American dream. And they both reflect the lives of working class um, families and both examine the places where people harmed by them um, by probably national policy and public discourse. So to tell everybody, um, you were fifth generation wheat farmer in Kansas, is that right? <laughs> and wrote in Heartland, you wrote, we were on the losing end of a lie. Um, and I wanna know what was that lie and um, how are socioeconomic inequality tied to the landscape itself? You're mute. There. Sorry about that. Um, so happy to to join you all, and and thanks for the the great question, Carrie. Um, so the the lie, which to to my mind is sort of the foundational myth uh, of our country, um, is that is that one's merit or the work put in somehow has something to do with the outcome. Uh, that you see in your life, whether that's measured uh, economically or otherwise. And um, you, you mentioned I was born on a Kansas wheat farm, um, fifth generation Kansas wheat farmer descended uh, as were many from my home region um, by way of poor white Europeans. Um, and we were working for generations land that originally belonged to um, the Kansas tribe and, and other indigenous peoples, um, but we, we didn't have a, a sense of that history. We just knew that um, what, whatever sort of privilege you could calculate by our race, um, we weren't experiencing or understanding in the moment of our hands bleeding in fields um, where we worked to raise wheat that went into the bread that more privileged people ate while they condescended to us um, about our culture and way of life. So. The reason that that has to do with environmental storytelling is because um, the 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 manual labor and the act of immersion into the landscape, um, which, which wasn't, by the way, noble. We were cogs in the wheel of industrial agriculture, uh, and we were trying to survive sometimes with thoughtless application of chemicals um, about which we knew little and, in fact, had been misled intentionally by corporations. So, um, you know, we we weren't like salt of the earth, we were human beings who like everyone else were trying to survive and I happened to be born into a trade that involved putting my hands in the earth and and working my body, as do uh, many of the members of my family still. So um, the, the thing about that sort of life and livelihood and work is that you, the, the, the environment, environment and nature and all the ways that we can, can um, understand environment was was not abstracted from the body. It was, we were one with it in many ways. Um, at a very young age, I already had the scars of, um, of that work on my body. My, the corneas of my eyes would get sunburned every summer when we were doing the wheat harvest. Um, and uh, skin cancer is just sort of like a given in my family. Um, and, and so the, the environment and us, we were, you know, the, the lower you go on the socioeconomic ladder that we sort of uh, uh, envision as the, um, the clunky working metaphor for class in this country, which is an ill understood uh, aspect of identity, um, that the lower you are on that ladder, the, the more, um, uh, the less buffer there is between you and the least, least um, savory aspects of environment, whether that's nature or something else. Um, often these days it comes in the form of chemicals and, and other strains on um, one's physiology. So, uh, so, so Heartland is very much about my, you know, and then I was a first generation college student, first at a, a state university, and then I went on to graduate school at Columbia in New York. Um, I was a very ambitious young woman who had very improbable dreams for someone who came where I did uh, from where I did. Um, I was raised by my grandparents who left school in sixth and ninth grade. So it wasn't just like first generation college student. It was like first generation uh, high school graduate. Um, and and I and the, the the gulf between myself and my peers was um, was so clear to me and so deeply felt and yet somehow was somehow 
glossed over or ill understood by those same peers from more privileged economic backgrounds. And, and it, and it, to me, it, it had something to do, it had everything to do with place, even though class is much more complicated than that, of course, in this vast land, one of the strange um, quirks, well, this is, 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 a, is a global um, uh, century old phenomenon now, basically the um, urbanization of our society. But, but I think that the way that that manifests in the United States has been this sort of you know, the two coasts and, and we have the rural flight from the middle or the rural spaces. If you want to make it, you've got to get out. We have all these languages about that have to do with removal from one space to seek another space. And in those spaces, we engage with our environment either in a very tactile way, if you're in the middle trying to get by on the bottom rung or in an abstracted uh, intellectual way, um, if, if you've gotten out or you've been born on into, um, a more privileged, usually urban space, not necessarily. Um, this is all complicated by the fact that, of course, there is abject poverty in urban spaces, and there is um, in wealth and rural. And um, it's, um, but, but it's, it's a the, the idea of place. I think, as relates to class, is something that that is um, really underexamined in in public discourse. In part because. We don't like those stories are still somehow like bundled into shame. I, I go into um, well in the before times. I did a lot of touring for events, and in every space that I entered, there would be someone who would come up to me afterwards and say, "You know, I I work in um, even maybe like a very rarefied environment, and you know, I'm from poor country, but we can't we don't talk about that because there's actually like." There, there's a code switch of class and of place and of and all of these things intersect with race and gender and and um, so so for me I I just I I one of my first lessons and being the the one who got out um, and and who ultimately in pretty short order went back <laughs> to write from that place and I'm coming to you from rural Kansas now um, one of the first and and um, uh, path defining lessons of my life was that the, the place I was from and the way in which we engaged with the earth in that place had something to do with the way that I was valued in the world. Um, and, and, and then my second book, which you mentioned, um, which sort of looks at Dolly Parton's music and also country music um, by women as a, as a sort of feminist text and a springboard to examine the intersection of gender and class. Um, she has a lot to do with place too, because what she did um, very intentionally, and the joke was on a lot of, of other folks for decades um, when she was sort of ahead of the curve, was she took the most um, uh, vilified tropes of her home environment, which was a poor holler in, um, in Tennessee, um, a, the, the trashy woman, and she painted it on herself and she went out in the world and kicked everyone's ass and was a creative genius simultaneously, and then forced someone to say, you know, there's a lot of like, well, I don't like country music, but I like Dolly Parton. And the thing that they're just slowly coming to is that like, actually, if you like Dolly Parton, you do like country music. And you might even like some people that live in rural Tennessee. Um, they have, they're still coming to it. They're still getting it. But like, she's, she as a genius storyteller and, and songwriter and performer, she could have like classed herself up a long time ago, you know, and often that's the American dream and as part of the lie. Um, and and she, she decided um, I'm going to really just like dig in to looking like what is perceived as trash, which has everything to do with the place that I come from. And that is how I become then an ambassador for um, the suffering people who, who I care about the most and know firsthand. Yeah, I mean, Dolly Parton, she transcends so much uh, in reading this book, you know, not just, she transcends it, but stays in it at the same time, which I find fascinating. Yeah. Transcending politics, even tr judgment, class, poverty, um, talk about up and out, but she doesn't sort of signal to that. Um, um, Sarah, I just want to ask a question that somebody's asked in the audience related to what you just said, Sarah, is Rafia uh, Zakaria asked, Sarah Smarsh says that her family was ignorant of environmental effects of their farming decisions and did not have agency in occupying indigenous land. I'm curious to know how these practices have changed now that they do know. Also, 
isn't her incredible success due to at least in some small part to white privilege that permits escape from the environment where one is born, escape in quotes. Oh yeah, to be sure, um, you know, the, the racial privilege that was simultaneous with the economic disadvantage um, is what we refer to as the white working class. And it's, it's a very hard concept for um, the way that we talk about race and class in this country, which was by design very long time ago, um, you know, uh, poised as a, as a conflict um, and, and something that's always in, in competition. Um, when in fact, um, people of color um, and white folks, all of the above, class affects every one of our lives. So class, when, when class is used as shorthand for white people, which that's something that the right does, likes to do and weaponize it as such, um, that's, a, that's a white supremacist frame. Um, and, and then on the left, sometimes there's an avoidance of the topic because it's like, if, is, it, is it okay to acknowledge that some pe white people experience economic distress? Um, it, is that in itself somehow problematic? The, you know, it, it, it's a both and conversation is the only one that can contain this concern um, that is so crucial and central to what's going on in our country right now and always has been, but is certainly coming to a head. So the fact that um, I left that farm where I was, you know, descended from people who benefited from the color of their skin in the theft of a land from indigenous peoples. Uh, I didn't know it when I was born in that place. I came to know and understand it. The, I think the part of the question was now what are we doing about it? We, we lost the farm as many people as many uh, family farms do in the late 90s. Um, so it, it's no longer a matter of what we would do because um, corporate agriculture uh, successfully by way of federal policy that was engineered to do it um, put us out of business. But um, uh, I will say that I live in rural Kansas now and what I'm in, involved in um, in, a, in a very personal way is restoring native prairies um, that basically uh, foolish white European settlers in their suppression of natural wildfires on these great plains where I live um, allowed for cedar, which are actually juniper trees, we call them cedar here, and, and um, sericea and other invasive species to take over um, these places where the buffalo once roamed. Um, I'm restoring to native prairie in a slow years long process, um, about 20 acres uh, of land um, not for the purpose of commerce or, or profit. And, and I will say that being engaged in uh, um, intention like that raises some eyebrows in these parts um, where uh, there, there is a certainly political diversity, but um, for the most part, people who, who are still here are um, somehow make their livelihood comes from the land. And so it's, it's somehow very suspect um, to be engaged in um, uh, a project with the land that, that defers to the land and seeks to revere it uh, rather than work it and strip it and, and earn from it. Um, and, but, and then I think the other piece of that question I wanna make sure that I get in is um, the fact that then I, um, I did leave that farm. It took a lot of work on my part. It, took, it, it, it required the overcoming of many hurdles um, to be a first generation college student and then go on into the academy as I did for some time and now work as a journalist. If I had been um, uh, a black girl or, or, or a young woman of color in this place um, seeking to follow that same path, of course, there would have been uh, even more hurdles. So um, that's why, um, you know, I think it's so important for those of us who, and, and, it's, a, and it's, a, it's a very small few um, from my particular region, but rural America at, um, as a broad concept, um, who have some sort of platform and voice now um, to be talking about race and class um, uh, mindfully in an intersectional way always um, because uh, it's um, when we become so, when, when the ideas be become very abstract, it's, it's easy to, um, to, to create these pat categories and say, now we're going to talk about race. Um, I have a, a podcast called The Homecomers, where I interview, for example, uh, a woman who she's basically a, a, an advocate of black farmers. She comes from the Black Belt, which is a crescent shaped region of really fertile land in the South, um, where most uh, black people are descendant of um, enslaved peoples. 
um, from Africa. And she talks about that experience and how like um, that has everything to do with her race, but also the she was raised by farmers um, and, and she herself is a farmer and she advocates for that group within that space. And so we've got, you know, we've got to allow these conversations to complicate um, paradoxically sort of in, in order to um, lift up the people who, who, um, who need love and, and assistance the most. Thank you for that really great response, Sarah. Um, Dolly Parton was also, <laughs> I'm gonna move on to Garnett, but I just wanna, this is a good segue to Garnett because Dolly Parton was also very funny. Um, and I, I would like to, I would like everybody to think about how, you know, we haven't talked about humor, where humor can get us in environmental storytelling, um, which brings me to Garnett a little bit, because um, <laughs> I'm always laughing with him. Um, Garnett, you write and teach about all the things we've talked about, public space, monuments, oh, oh, I don't know, so many things, divides, violence, conflicted landscapes, especially in your piece, um, Black and Blue, which was the piece that John published in the first issue of Freeman's. Um, you write in that piece, the streets had their rules, and I love the challenge of trying to master them. I learned how to be alert to surrounding dangers and nearby delights and prided myself on recognizing telling details that my peers missed. What did your peers miss that you did not? And I think that might lead us into sort of your thinking about environmental storytelling and maybe commenting on anybody, anything else, anybody else said to you. I, I think in, in, in that piece of in what you're saying and you know, what it might mean to think about missing things and how environmental storytelling ties in with that. And one of the things I think that is also missing, even though we speak of environmental storytelling and the climate crisis and talk about time, most times we're really just talking about space, which is why in a Simmons reflection and in a Emily's in a reflection in about Wanda that I began with, you know, so important. What I was walking around looking for and what at pieces about so much is about the search for Wanda and what actually happens when Wanda is stolen from you. Um, or what happens when the world throws up you know, barriers between you and Wanda. You know, what happens, how much more impoverished um, a life it is um, without Wanda. And so, you know, Wanda is in part a response to time. Wanda is a way of inhabiting time um, and populating it with, you know, you know, more careful attention, with more awe, with, um, you know, with beauty. And one way of thinking of the climate crisis is, you know, a corruption, um, uh, interruption, um, a denial of wonder, you know, and in many ways, you know, also of time. And so, you know, what, what are we left with, you know, in the absence of wonder? You know, what happens when, you know, wonder is, you know, you know taken away from us? You know, think of that marvelous book, um, World of Wonders. Um, and then it's, you know, especially it's beautiful subtitle um, in praise of fireflies, whale sharks, and other astonishments. Um, Amy, whose surname, um, you know, practiced many times to pronounce, um, but I fear pronouncing it, um, you know, lest I do injustice to that beautiful surname, but I'll put it in the, in the links in the book. But, you know, again, in a network invites us to wonder, in, in invites us to, you know, in a, you know, pay attention to the world or, you know, think of Adam, you know, you know it's like a Jews kid's um, poem, in a praise the mutilated world, you know, his invitation that in the midst of, you know, you know, all the details, you know, the world in all its rich capaciousness, you know, invites us, you know, it invites us to wonder. Um, and when I say the world, I mean, both human and non-human world. And so, you know, you know, again, in that SS thinking about things that my peers have seen and I have missed, or things that I have seen that my peers, you know, have missed. And much of it is about, you know, in our relationship to time, you know, how do we inhabit the world? You know, you know, how do we spend time with things? How do we, you know, pay attention to things? How do we accept the world's invitations? But, you know, how does different things in, how do different things in the world, you know, interrupt us? Um, and so think of like exemplary stuff like um, Amitav Ghosh's magnificent book, uh, Nutmeg's Curse, you know, which was excerpted in Orion um, with Brute. And you take something as small as a little nutmeg and just 
all the marvelous things that the nutmeg can do. Um, but then he looks, you know, and he looks at, you know, you know how the nutmeg, you know, gives us a different experience, not only of time, but of space, but also traces over time and shows how that nutmeg, you know, the ways in which, you know, greed and colonialism and, um, you know, the need to dominate, um, not merely human life, but non-human life, and has made this, you know, you know, you know, look a beautiful thing of wonder. Um, become in a in a in an obscenity um, or adequately sure obscenities in it, and you know all of which is to say you know you know what Gosh does you know you know so wonderfully or what you see so wonderfully in that book World of Wonders or you see in um, Zagajewski's in a poem in a praise and mutilated world, you know our invitations to inhabit time differently, an invitation you know to wonder, um, an invitation to see and to truly pay attention. And to show what actually what happens when that is revoked from you, when it's denied you, you know, you know what kind of world, you know, what kind of humanity, uh, what kind of relationships, uh, you know, are we left with? And so, the call or the challenge really for environmental writing is to actually get away from the obsession with space um, and to more consciously think about what does it mean to actually think about time? You know, how do we write about time? How do we you know, think about what it means to inhabit time and what it actually happens when in that time that we're inhabiting becomes a much more impoverished, you know, much cheaper, much more degraded one? Thank you. Um, you know, what, <sighs> that was a lot. Um, <laughs> you, you, speaking of inhabiting public space, I mean, that's what you do in that essay, you inhabit kind of the, ultimate public space, you walk and you bring to light all the division borders they're in, kind of like a little bit of what John does in the park, what Emily does in Sparkbird to, you know, kind of watching, observing, um, what, are, what are the other promises and perils of the city? And then I want, if you can talk about that, and then I see there's a couple of questions and it looks like John's gonna answer one from Barbara after that. Is that right, John? Looks like you are. Um, but yeah, if you could talk about the promises and perils of the city of an urban landscape, which again, not everybody thinks of as an environmental thing or environmental storytelling milieu. But, you know, one of the promises of the city is the promise of coexistence, you um, know, coexistence, you know, in a, in a with a whole variety of different peoples with you know, in a different beliefs, histories, uh, ethnicities, um, abilities, preferences, um, but also in a, in a rich coexistence um, between human and non-human life. Um, you could get to follow around the birds, um, follow around the birds you know, as they're painted um, you know, on the walls um, in Washington Heights, you know, follow them around and try to find your spark bird in you know, the way Emily does so marvelously and you know that beautiful sf hers uh you know it's you know one in which you know at the same time as you're you know following around those birds and just seeing the beauty the promise of seeing you know you know one of the things that the city does is it invited the promise of seeing of seeing things that you never thought to see before of reminding of mysteries you know some in you know, mentions you know just to exhaust the limits of your knowledge and to you know come into a you know, better, better self a richer self a more expansive selves because of your encounter with other selves. But also the Paris of the city is, you know, it's a place again, you know, with its rank um, and obscene inequalities, uh, with its way of, you know, you know, forcing our converging on us, you know, different ways of being, you know, because of, you know, how hard it is to, you know, make it through with its, you know, constant threats, um, whether it be in a climate crisis or, even in a, the violence, in a, in a the violence which emerges from greed, which emerges in so many other forms. And so it's at once, you know, the wonderful promise, you know, of coming into a better self, but also the peril of, you know, in a, encountering a degraded self because of all these awful forces in, a, in the city, you know, emerging from greed and what it does. Thank you. Um, this, before I go into questions, um, did, do, do any of you want to say anything about what each other has said? I, I know I, I thought we'd have a conversation, but we have, you know, um, little time left um, for questions and discussion between all of you. 
there's Barbara here has this question on the issues of monuments in the August issue of Amy Brady's Burning Worlds newsletter. She focuses on Maya Lin's ghost forest, Madison Square Park. The forest is 49 white cedar trees cleared from a dead woodland in New Jersey. I see these trees as a natural monument for what Maya Lin describes as a metaphor for the outsized impact of looming environmental calamity. And um, there's just a note that says John will answer this question live. So I'm expecting John to answer this question. <laughs> uh, the, um, I think uh, one thing that environmental storytelling could encompass is coming up with more creative um, monuments for our interactions um, in, 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 in spaces that have their own history. Um, I, I completely agree with um, Barbara's uh, example there. And I would also um, say maybe Teresita Fernandez is another artist who does this. She also had um, a piece in Madison Square Park in New York called Fata Morgana, um, which is like 500 globes that were sort of canopies over the lawn. Um, and in other outdoor works, she's, um, she's even exhibited sort of site-specific work uh, interrogating the way that landscape has been looked at before by Frederick Church and others. Um, and in her and in her work that's inside galleries, it's often inspired by the natural world. So it's like she brings the unnatural world out into nature and the natural world into the gallery um, where you see these giant hunks of cobalt and other elements um, that have this in, immense power and mystery. Um, and I hope at one point she winds up in um, Orion's pages because she's one of the most you know beautiful artists at work today. So I, I think um, storytelling um, doesn't have to only simply involve uh, a human scale narrative to me. Um, the, the time, as Garnett mentioned, time, time is the ultimate narrative. Um, and there are lots of other participants in time besides humans. Um, There's another question from Gretchen. Um, can I have some examples of good environmental writing about the center of the country? I can think of examples for the coast, the Great Lakes, the South, the American West, but for rural flyover country where I now live, I am finding myself short in the right language and I would like to have it for my students. I should say, I don't know if I said at the beginning, we're gonna to try to provide a, also a reading list after this, but if anybody wants to respond to this now too. Uh, I would suggest um, this book is, gosh, it must be 15 years old at this point. Um, most people know um, Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz for her book, An Indigenous, An Indigenous People's History of the United States, uh, play on Zen, obviously. Um, she wrote a memoir prior to that called Red Dirt Girl. Um, that's about her, so she was raised by, um, she's uh, part Native American, part Irish, and was raised on a uh, poor farm in Oklahoma. And it's a very, it's, um, you know, while it's not a direct commentary on the landscape, it, the landscape is, is a character. And I feel like that, that part of, so um, the Midwest is like that term, highly controversial around these parts, because what is the Midwest? Um, we usually said the lower Midwest. So I'm in Kansas, um, Oklahoma. The, often I find that when I, if, when I'm with my friends in New York to them, like Ohio is the Midwest. And 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 perhaps it is, but I think when I think that that sort of like northern stretch of like where there are Great Lakes and um, and such is is mo even while less considered than other landscapes, it's still more considered than the region that I would call like the Great Plains. Um, and um, and and that book is a great place to start for just getting uh, a feel for the landscape and the way that it interacts with the people on it. Thank you. Anybody else? Garnett, would you talk about your friend Marie Mutsuki Market? I was about to mention Marie uh, Market. Um, I just had a brain freeze in a book that I've read at least four or five times. Um, you know, um, but it, it has come back, um, American Harvest. Um, but you know, you know, Marie's book, which you know, again. Uh, finds ways of you know having us think not merely about in you know, a space about land you know, in our you know relationship and our connection to it, but
but also about time, you know, what it means to think you know, about a harvest and the kind of labor that goes into a harvest, but more than that, the kind of in you know, a love and attention um, in that it goes in and dealing with our beliefs, you know, for responsibilities to each other, um, you know, in across, you know, different, you know, political, um, you know, differences, different belief you know, differences, but also in you know, our responsibilities to, you know, to nature, um, to non-human life. Um, and then also what it means to actually understand the heart and to think about the heart and, and the different people who are working hard in you know, across you know, in a variety of you know, class structures to um, you know, develop um, you know, not merely a relationship to that heartland, but also you know, how so much of our resources, um, so much of the, the ways in which we provide you know, for ourselves, you know, and it comes from the heartland and the centrality of the heartland to our understanding um, in a, in a for ourselves, but also to you know, our ability to provide for ourselves rather than this flyover country. So one of the beautiful things that Mary does is to take this place that is this huge undifferentiated place in far too many imaginations and make, in ensure in all its capaciousness, its complexity, its multitudinousness, um, in a, and, it's, in a, and make it in a, in a show how much it's an essential place rather than this in a no name flyover country, so-called flyover country as we think of it. Um, and it also helps that it's written beautifully um, in it with wonderful and in a nimble pacing. And so just the kind of writing that you want um, in, in terms of environmental writing. Thank you. Um, there was another question here. Also, for that, one thing that, you know, you know, we we'll often ignore the poets, but the poets are not to be ignored. So don't sleep on the poets. I mean, we'll have it in the list that we give, but in a, you know, so often we're rushing straight for um, you know, the nonfiction writers, but you know, you know, there's a whole host of you know poets, you know, you know, who in their propensity for you know, in a in a compress, you know, in a um, compression, in a found a way to actually expand time in that in a compression. And so you know, I spoke about you know, you know Zagajewski, but there are even people who think are not speaking about um, environmental writing that has everything to do with environmental writing. So like, you know, at least for me, over and over again, I keep going and thinking about uh, the way um, Vislava Simbroska ends, um, you know, her poem, The Century's Decline, to talk about all the horrors of the century. And she ends it by saying, oh, again, and as ever, as may be seen above, the most pressing questions are the naive ones. And I think a lot of environmental writing at its best in his writing that gives us the space to ask the naive questions. In his in a writing that actually reminds us that often the most pressing questions in are the basic ones, the naive ones, in a first order questions. And so in environmental writing at its best many times invite us back to ask the basic questions about who are we, what are our responsibilities to each other, how do we coexist? You know, you know, what do we owe not merely each other as humans, but in non-human life? And how ought we to be in the world? Which goes back to what Emily was talking about, about Camille's essay, like all writing is environmental writing, if it's asking the questions, right, Emily? Um, are there any questions that I've missed here? Um, specific works of fiction, we will, we will definitely get that on the list, I think, unless anybody wants to talk about anything now. Um, um, will, you, will, you, will you put Picnic at Hanging Rock on the list? And I just can delete, put whatever you want. delete everything else on the list. <laughs> so the list just says Picnic at Hanging Rock and that's the only book. You can put whatever you want in there. Okay. Um, there, was, there was a question that Emily answered, um, but what do you know about transiting out of a, this was towards Garnett, but I think anybody could answer unless anybody wants to talk about anything else too. Um, what do you know about transiting out of obsessive clock time into different, perhaps more expansive way of being in with, in slash with time have been unable to successfully transition myself out of speed and info glut. I think John wrote a whole book about that, the tyranny of email <laughs> years ago too. Um, so yeah, if anybody wants to talk about how you can transition yourself out of speed and info glut, I'm sure there are a lot of people interested in the answer to that. Yes, interested. Turn off your phone. <laughs> I mean, maybe as a corollary to that, um, I, Garnett, I'm, hope, I'm, I'm curious to hear, you mentioned something as though we were all supposed to understand what you meant. And 
maybe everybody else in the room did and I didn't. Uh, but you you talked about um, um, about a different way of existing in time and and the the sort of muscle of wonder as being the thing that manipulates your your perception or your stewardship of time. Uh, what is what what I'm just gonna say what and 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 let you follow up on that. That sounds like the basic question everybody had talking to me like what? <laughs> <laughs> so uh you know, by which you, you know, what it means to inhabit time differently. Um, in other words, you know, the kind of rich attentiveness, um, the you know, room, um, you know, for all, uh, for beauty, you know, to listen. Uh, and so, for example, in a lot of environmental writing, just to give one of many examples, you know, we begin in a, in assuming in, in a particular subset of environmental writing, you know, the climate crisis. We assume, you know, with a, in a presumption, you know, sometimes even condescension that people are the same place that we're at, and have the same level of anger or frustration in our knowledge. Um, and so, you know, we take it that there's this common language when it ought to be, you know, an invitation from us to, you know, move, like I think of in a climate science that Emily wrote as just a beautiful example of that, that rather than presuming that. You know, we're all at the same you know, place you know, of concern, anxiety, you know, fear. Um, you know, she you know, assumes that it's her job to invite us you know, to you know, go on this journey with her, to, to move through and to begin to see the world open itself up, reveal itself in all its in a, in a, in a wit and whimsy, something that's all too missing from environmental writing, but you see it a lot in Emily's writing. So it opens the door in its wit, in its whimsy, in, a, in its beauty, um, in its charm, in its frustration, in its complexity. And as you're moving along and she you know, begins to feel um, you know, the claustrophobia you know, of the climate crisis, you begin to feel that claustrophobia you know, you know, with her. And so it feels like what it is, you know, that interruption, um, that denial, um, you know, that degrading, that stealing. Um, but she doesn't, you know, begin there and assume that you're there with her. You know, you know, she begins, you know, with the word and its wonder, in its in its invitations, and then we, in a suddenly encounter the hurdles, um, the obstacles, um, you know, the closed doors, and so that's part of it. What it means to you know, in inhabit time differently, to see, you know, to see the world and have the world open itself up to you in all its in a multitudinousness, its capaciousness, its complexity. Um, it's annoyances, um, but you feel the world, you know, creeping up on you and opening itself, opening itself up to you. You feel your pupils, you know, in, a, in a adjusting, you know, to the new levels of light, you know, before you, and therefore have a very different experience of what it means to, you know, know the world and to be known uh, by that world. And so, you know, it it means a kind of writing that is not a presumptuous writing, which is what so much environmental writing is. You know that oh we have this shared language you know you know we're setting the same emotional um, you know in a starting ground rather than the invitation to say I'm going to invite you into this particular world um, I'm going to take your emotions I'm going to take your time I'm going to take your beliefs seriously and ask you to move along with me and so you know in other words you know I'm going on a, in a quest and I'm going to take in a quest rather than say oh you know we're at the same place. It's like the kind of writing that's you know says in a in a in a hurricane just came in in a in a made this amount of damage this is the amount of lives that have been lost this is um, how much you know, it has affected the GDP and this is how much land is cleared out and then you know people are not responding like oh people are so unresponsive they're so narrow you know you know that you know you know all they care about right now is what dress um, Kim Kardashian wore to the you know, Met Gala. And I said, but the reality is that you waited until maybe 3,000 words in, in the middle of the piece, it said, saying, Samantha and Garnet meets her brunch every Sunday on that beach. You know, Samantha tells Garnet two o'clock because he knows that Garnet will show up like an hour late. And so it's really three o'clock um, in a, in a, as far as you know, Samantha sees it. But this week, 
in it, he goes, he doesn't see Garnet, and it turns out it's a one-time Garnet on time, and the water in it gets pulled out. And so in it, in it, there is that in a in a in a moment of loss between two friends. And there were two friends in a 15 groups of friends who were meeting in that beach. And that beach was one in of 17 beaches in that district, which is one of 14 um, in the districts in that municipality, and it then moves up. And then at the end, all told, these are the amount of people who have died. And so there, you know, you've been brought into the world, you know, in of cement, you know, and garnet, been made um, and been invited to care for them. Then you know, invited to you know, care about the others who are the beach alongside them and then keep moving up. And so by the time you get to that staggering number, emotionally it has a you know, much more resonant impact than to the start of that data dump at the, you know, at the beginning. And so it's a different experience of time. It's a different way you know, of in inhabiting time, you know, one which you know, invites you to care, invites you to be attentive, invites you to listen. And it's not in a rush, um, you, know, you know, with a presumption that you're all beginning at the same place. It assumes that it's the writer's job to make you care rather than that you've, you know, both beginning you know, at the same place, you know, with the same you know, levels of care and also the same levels of knowledge. So when I talk about inhabiting time, it means a different relationship with trust. It means to actually, you know, write in, in which, you know, you know, the structure, as I've said to students time and again, is not merely in a function of organization, but your structure is in, in, a, in a function of trust. What does it mean to actually invite you in and then to you know, you know, assume that in a, in a, from sentence to sentence, paragraph to paragraph, section to section, you're growing in trust. You know, you're growing in understanding. You're growing in your ability with which to see. And so too much environmental writing is about you know, how I'm seen rather than an invitation you know, to the person reading you know, as to how to see. And so writing ought to be about seeing rather than about how we are seen. Thank you. Samantha, did that answer your question perhaps? Yeah, but now I see Sarah nodding her head. <laughs> and I wanna ask, um, does that ever happen to you when you read a book? Oh, you're muted, Sarah. Uh, yes, exactly what Garnett said. <laughs> um, yeah, I was nodding because I concurred. You want me to expand? I'm just curious <laughs> to know, like, what's the last time you read a book? When was the last time you read a book and you put it down and you're like, oh, I forgot what time it was. Like, I, yeah. Yeah. I, feel, I feel time differently now. Um, yeah. I inhabit time differently now as a result of that. Yeah, for sure. I think that those um, shifts, regardless of what genre it's happening within, um, are somehow more, um, I find myself more transported if the, the, the time on the human clock that's being uh, reckoned with is not our time. So if even if it's fiction, if it's set in roughly the now and, and our current moment, um, I'm I'm hyper vigilant and distressed by the um, the terrors of that moment that we're all directly familiar with versus whether if whether it's nonfiction or fiction or poetry, if there's it sit, situates you somehow intentionally in the past, whether because it was written in the past or because it's written about the past from the now or conversely to or uh, to the future, um, then there's I, I, I find myself as a reader more easily freed from the the tyranny of email, if you will. <laughs> um, but um, but yeah, I I think that that's a, a lovely aspiration for any writer. I, I don't necessarily as a as a writer ever um, intentionally think about how I'm handling the space time continuum. But but Garnett's words inspire me to to maybe do so. Speaking of the space time continuum, <laughs> we're, we're exceeding it right now. <laughs> I think by a half hour or so. Um, so um, I still have people yelling about John's, John's poem, but if he doesn't want to read it, that's fine. Um, and Ellen Berkowitz, I want to I want to respond to your question about specific works of fiction. On bookshop.org, Orion has a, a shop or a page, and there's a lot of book recommendations that I put on there every season, as well as um, as well as um, on our website. 
I, there's book rec recommendations for every issue. Um, what's that, John? What are you saying there? Um, read this from Orion, I think. Yes. Um, so um, thank, I, I, I think we should stop. It's like we're, we're a half hour beyond or 15 minutes beyond, right? Unless anybody else has anything additional to say and until John reads his poem, which is gonna end the night because everybody keeps emailing me separately and togetherly to, for you to read it now because we talked about it. So we're going to have to, the death givers. It's not really a nice note to end on, but. <laughs> I can't hear you. Wait. It's not a good note to end on at all. It's Let's like not a, that. We're not going to read it. We're just, no. But you should read his book. Anyway. I, I think you should end on like Barry Lopez or, or anything, <laughs> anything but that, you know. <laughs> <The death givers. laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, we're yeah. not going to get his book. Slime is, slime is way better than the Death Givers. Get, it, <laughs> get his book and read it yourself. That's my answer. <laughs> But um, thank you. I, I think our Center for Fiction people, did they go to bed or are they still there? Um, there they are. Yay. Did they go to bed. I'm, it's 1.30 here. I know. It's okay. You're Let's fine. let John go to bed. So, John, I, I, this is way past my bedtime. Um, no, but thank you, everybody. Samantha, Lace, um, Lacey, um, Emily had to leave. She had to meet a thesis student. Um, so I don't want you all to leave before I say goodbye and thank you. And I love you all dearly so much. <laughs> I'm so, I feel like I just did this really so I could have them all here together for me. <laughs> it was great to hear you all. And um, we'll put this video up within two weeks and we'll have the, the book recommendation list from everybody, including some that people added to the chat that they thought uh, people oh, should good read. you capture those yeah that would yeah. be great yeah um well thank you all thanks carrie for putting this together thanks no, no. everyone for joining us and hanging in and um john i hope you get some really good sleep he's fine <laughs> <laughs> good night all right good night everyone Bye.